der nächste Punkt unserer Agenda äh, bestreitet der Manuel, Manuel Eckmann von Fertig. DevSec Ops in Practice, Low Altitude Alpinism for Engineers. Das war relativ klar, gewesen, dass irgendetwas mit Bergen kommt. Das ist sehr, sehr klar. Für mich, äh, dans le titre, il va avoir quelque chose avec les montagnes. Euh, parce que moi, je connais Manuel et puis je sais qu'il aime très, très bien tout ce qui est montagne. Et puis, voilà. Donc, assez clair que ça va être quelque chose avec des montagnes. Donc, Manuel Eckelmann, euh, ciseaux chez Fertig. Il a aussi étudié ici, à l'école, hein, fait le bachelor ici, après avoir fait un, un apprentissage de, comme électronicien à l'école des métiers de Fribourg. Et tu as aussi fait des études de master à Fribourg, à l'Union Fribourg et à Berne. Euh, tu as aussi fait la certification CSSLP, Certified Secure Software Lifecycle Professional. C'est juste, oui, glaube ça. CSSLP, ouais, certifiziert, ouais. ist der Manuel auch, hat er auch noch gemacht. Ich glaube, es ist expiré. Es ist expiré, ja, ja. Ich muss de temps en temps, temps re, refaire la, la, comment dire, la Certification. Avant d'être de, de venir, de, de venu chez, chez Fertig, tu as travaillé chez Swisscom. J'avais marqué 8 ans, ouais, 8 ans chez Swisscom comme Security Architect. Je pense, Manuel, tu vas nous dire encore un peu plus sur toi, sur ta personnalité et surtout sur comment vous faites la sécurité chez Fertic. Merci, Manuel. Great, thanks a lot, Mike. I'm going to talk in English, if that's fine. Uh, I was told it was, so. <laughs> First of all, thanks to the organizing group for... Uh, organizing uh, this seminar uh, and to the University of, University of Applied Sciences for having us tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, DevSecOps in practice and I named this talk Low Altitude Alpinism for Engineers. Most, first of all, because for me there's a lot of things in common between DevSecOps and mountaineering. So in both, in both disciplines you want to go fast You want to go light, you want to be able to change directions very quickly, and you want to be safe, right? As a mountaineer, you prefer not to die, as a company as well, uh, which, is, uh, which is great. Um, in this talk, I'm going to give some, some insights into how we define and practice DevSecOps at Fertig. But let, let's get started. A quick word on myself. I will not talk more about me, so <laughs> that's even, even less. But uh, I graduated in, uh, so my name is Manuel Jekelmann and I graduated from the University of Applied Sciences in 2008. That's a long, long time ago. Back then I was still called an engineer, so an engineer. Um, and I, um, as Mike told you, I worked at Swisscom as a security architect. And I joined Fertig as a backend uh, engineer and a security engineer in 2019. Um, If you don't know Fertig yet, it's your lucky day, actually. Here it is. Fertig is the easiest way to public transportation. And here's how it works. Uh, you download the app, mobile app. Uh, you would swipe the button, check in, board a train, a bus, a boat, whatever. Then whenever you get controlled, you would show the ticket. Um, arrive at your destination, you would swipe back again, check out, and then the system does the rest, computing your journey and your uh, and the cheapest price, cheapest ticket for that, uh, for that journey. Fertig is an app for everyone, uh, for you and me. Uh, it can also be used for you know, businesses, for example. So for example, if your business wants their employees to transit from one office location to another, um, That's also things that we can do. Um, also, you can take you know, your relatives with you or wh whoever is next to you, uh, multi-passenger, basically. If all of that looks familiar to you, well, Fertig is also the technology behind SPB EasyRide. So whenever you use SPB's mobile app, uh, EasyRide, you're using Fertig. A few numbers about the company. Uh, Fertig was founded in 2016 seven years ago, and since then we have expanded to about 30 regions, 
uh, in uh, well Switzerland, Germany, Austria, France, Belgium, and more. And um, since uh, our inception, we have processed about 128 million uh, trips. And right now, we are processing about one event per millisecond in our system, just to give you uh, order of magnitude of, of the performance of the, num of the volume that we're processing. Uh, we are 130 employees in the company, out of which uh, about 55 are in the tech team. And uh, the tech team, in the tech team, we are our security team. Uh, we're four people. Next Monday, we're four. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we are um, back-end engineers, mobile engineers, data scientists, and also infrastructure and reliability engineers. So, um, Fertig is a tech and product startup. And since its inception, the tech team has developed the whole platform on its own, so including, you know, writing the code, patching, uh, monitoring, and also getting up during the night uh, when things go sideways. So we have this on-call rotation uh, on which uh, many engineers are on. Um, it really DevOps from the outset. You build it, you own it. Our organization is very outcome-oriented. So we need to provide value. And in doing that, we value agility and also leanness. So we try to um, be able to change uh, direction easily, and also we try to solve only the problems that really matter, that bring us forward, and not more. We don't try to, you know, build something that we're never going to need. But what we value most is quality. That's really the highest priority. We strongly believe that by being, by having a high level of tech quality, we um, are faster in the long run. Even in the case of, um, of the conflict, you know, quality versus deadline, we try to slice down whatever is at hand so we can do the solution uh, just for the, for the, for to meet the, the deadline. And then we usually we stick to the issue to gain back uh, to the level of quality that we want to achieve and that we're used to. And, you know, it's really crucial in that case to finish the work, to stick on it, to clean up the shortcuts, to, to continue the work on that. Um, to illustrate how that looks in practice, um, I have prepared a quick screenshot. So whenever you ask on our Slack, what's the highest priority, there would the Slack bot be chiming in and says, quality has the highest priority. <laughs> that was a long time back. Uh, that was set up by our CTO, I think. And that also shows the leadership commitment here to, uh, to this quality uh, uh, mindset. That also means that leadership is not afraid of saying no to, you know, uh, too much thing, too many things. Uh, and also shows that this quality mindset is really top down. By the way, the CTO also graduated from the University of Applied Sciences here in Fribourg. So kudos to this school, probably. Well. From a security point of view, you can uh, see that, you know, this engineering culture, this quality mindset is a very fruitful ground for, you know, implementing security in such an organization. And that's now when I'm transitioning to this security aspects, I will talk about, um, you know, the base idea, what's at stake, and then also give you some insights into how we do it at Fertig. Well, you know this, this double donut, right? Uh, surprisingly, <laughs> or not so much. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is actually both sides of this thing, right? So I want to talk about threat modeling, uh, secure technology and code. I also want to talk about secrets and access management, a bit uh, complementary here, and security incident response in this DevSecOps cycle. Let's start with threat modeling. Well, threat modeling basically is the question of what can go wrong. Um, that needs to be asked before actually starting to build anything. And it should be asked by every engineer who's working on the product. 
uh, we can take the findings from this threat modeling to then influence all this, uh, the following uh, phases of the process. Namely, uh, for example, you, you, you want to tackle a threat in code, obviously you want to um, test for it, you want to monitor it, and, uh, and with that you have really uh, the threat modeling influencing everything in the process. Also, it needs to be simple enough for everyone to do. And at Fertig, well, by the way, this is Bruno from our sales team. <laughs> Not joking. <laughs> uh, at Fertig, we do, we do design documents, right? And we have a design document um, process. It's basically a request for comment uh, document that states the problem of the technical solution that you want to, to uh, solve, to come up with, the goal and the solution itself. And in this design document, we have the security, security section. We do this for every feature, for every change. And um, design documents are nice because they are persistent and they're reviewable. So we can you know, uh, design this whole review process around that happens with engineers and, and involves also security. Then we enable for threat modeling. We have a guide that is open to, uh, for everyone to consult that is also linked in, the, uh, in this template for design documents. We also teach threat modeling in our uh, training, technical training for engineers that is mandatory for everyone. And we have security champions. Security champions are basically representatives of security in all the different engineering teams, right? And these security champions can typically support um, um, on, on doing a threat model, give an initial review on it, and, and help like that to get to a better solution by finding threats early. We, <coughs> we, um, we do threat modeling by making it very simple. So we took away a lot of the complexity that you will find in textbooks and um, we really isolated the essence of it and everyone has to do it, everyone who wants to do a, a design document and it really needs to be a low threshold activity so you can get to it very fast, right? The objective is to integrate this question of what can go wrong into this engineering culture and quality mindset. Very concretely, this means that typically engineers will, in their design document, describe what they, what they want to build, be clear about the data flows. Um, this can be with such a diagram that you can see here, or you know, can be represented in interfaces, textual representation, whatever. And then we ask, typically we, we, we uh, ask people to, to apply this STRIDE acronym which um, describes the six, the six uh, threat classes of spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. I'm not gonna go into details, but for example, uh, you could say like here, what's the, what would be a, a spoofing thread in this design? It could be that someone spoofs the user uh, and places a booking um, on this reservation service. As I said, the textbook methods like, you know, trust boundaries and whatnot, we've left it all away. I think we win more by making it so simple than making it super complete. Also, um, also we um, hint uh, towards focusing on logic flaws. Logic flaws being much more about can you basically add a data field in the booking that would book this thing for someone else rather than technical, uh, technical vulnerabilities like, okay, you're missing TLS on, on, some, on some endpoint. <coughs> this would be the transition over to secure tech and code because this, this TLS endpoint would have to be protected by default, basically. So um, what we want to find out here is can we uh, reduce the number of security problems that we have to solve by adopting the right technology. Um, and what we want is to really gain in security by just, you know, 
adopting the secure programming languages, uh, vetted frameworks, and also a solid software architecture. Now, at Fertic, what we do is that we use Java, which is a strongly typed, uh, so strongly typed language for services exposed to the internet. We use also Spring Boot, uh, which is very common, well reviewed, and um, typically they've demonstrated that they are able to patch very quickly um, when something goes wrong. We also use a software architecture that's called hexagonal architecture, and it's a layered model, right? And that's the image here on the right. And I quickly want to explain why it's so, so favorable for, for security. It's because it's a layered model. Well, when, I, when we start on the left side, we have different interfaces, which may be, for example, a command line interface or some HTTP endpoint. And you would have an adapter which would handle requests from both worlds, actually, right? And it would be specific to that to that interface. It would extract the request parameters from a request and then convert that into a domain uh, value object, let's say, and pass that on to this yellow application layer, one, one, uh, one layer in, and this application layer would then um, validate whether the parameters on its own uh, make sense and would maybe enrich the, date, the request within more data before passing it on to the domain model, the domain layer, uh, which would actually do the, the essence of your, uh, of your application. So which would do the, whatever the application is made for. The domain layer can then reach out, let's say the domain layer decides to send out a notification. It would reach out to uh, an interface that abstracts away uh, code that is part of an adapter to send out an SMS or an email notification. With that, we have untangled this, this complex beast and we have small, very simple portions of code that are testable individually, which is a huge benefit in terms of security because it's very simple and you know complexity is the enemy of security always. And, and it's really a big win in terms of, of software security here. Ultimately, all of these concepts and, and technologies need to be applied consistently amongst different, um, different services. So standardization here is the key for security, even though the different services do something else. In our case, um, it, also allows you it also allows you to, to do um, things like uh, on-call rotation, which is much with many more people because everyone uh, everyone knows what uh, how the application is built so the expert know-how on the different applications is is distributed right in our experience <coughs> we had we had an issue uh, you've probably heard about this spring for shell that was lost here but back then we uh, patched uh, our back then about 30 services within a few hours including you know doing the actual patch, then testing, then um, releasing to prod, etc. So a few hours, and I think that demonstrates the strength of uh, also this, um, this approach, this consistent approach. Next on, I want to talk about secrets, uh, secrets and access management. Um, Problem here is that in a DevOps environment, oftentimes many people need many credentials to, you know, access um, access uh, services to take on their their responsibility of an on-call duty, right? And if you have many people, many many credentials, the potential for disclosure, whether accidental or or malicious, is very high, and potentially, you know, access is not restricted, so the risk for a disaster grows with everyone getting access, right? Um, now, the idea here is to give only access to required data, to required systems, and to give only access during a short period of time that during which this access is really needed. Um, also, we need to make sure that secrets and credentials are not shared uh, between humans, right? 
is one thing, and then between systems is the other things is the other thing that helps us um, to do this secret rotation. Ultimately, um, we want to get rid of passwords wherever possible. So the ideal world, in the ideal world, we don't leak passwords because there are none, right? Um, let's go into how we do it at Fertic. We're not all Dave, huh? who uh, is the enemy of everything technology you, you, you put in place. But Dave is, is representative for us in a weak moment. Maybe an accident happens and you have leaked a, a secret, right? So we're, con we're conscious of breaches happening or, or disclosures happening of secrets. To err is human. Um, in order to tackle that, we have created and developed a system ourselves uh, at Fertig that allows us to um, issue scoped and also temporary credentials for an infrastructure service. Scoped in the sense of um, only for a subset of the data that we need access to and temporary in the sense of valid for a few hours only. So you would log in using SSO to that system, single sign-on, um, request the environment and, uh, and whatever you need access to, and then you would get a dedicated user provision for only a few hours to do your job. And that is also traceable and auditable, which is, which is great. Uh, we've also added a common line interface consuming the REST API of that. And the common line interface will then directly invoke the infrastructure service client, which with that closes the loop and abstracts this whole uh, password management completely away from the user, from the engineer. So you can log into that infrastructure service by just, you know, clicking login on like you would log in with Google, right? Um, on, the, on the topic of uh, facilitating password rotation, what's important here is that we have a dedicated user per, uh, per client service, so per application service. Um, because, um, and, and that can be done with, with uh, a dedicated naming convention. So you would immediately see whenever a user does not belong to a particular service, uh, it's on the wrong service, right? Um, and you can also scope access for these services. And with that, you can then very easily automate or semi-automate password rotation uh, in order to make sure that you have um, you know, you can change your passwords often because, you know, passwords can leak and you can potentially not notice. We, a story for that, we learned this the hard way because um, um, at some point we, you know, we grew, right? We also, on our, our uh, infrastructure grew. Uh, we would split services. We would split out single uh, components. And then typically what happens, engineers would copy the required environment variables or required configuration. And um, at some point we wanted to, to rotate a password for, a, for one service because, you know, someone pasted it in, I don't know, somewhere in a form, don't, doesn't matter. And, um, <laughs> and when revoking the user, all of a sudden the other service stopped working which is the worst because the other person didn't know what, what happened, but well, you find out pretty quickly, uh, but it costs downtime and is, and is really bad for you know, availability of the system. Right? Our ambition on ultimately is to reduce manual, uh, manually handled secrets to a minimum. Uh, on security incident response, um, so we know security incidents we will happen, right? Um, the question is how prepared is an organization? And also how much time do you spend responding to a security incident? Because especially as a startup, you want to be, you want to be productive, you want to make progress in your system, right? You want to implement features and not fight incidents. Um, also in the last few years, You've se we've seen that um, trust can be earned or lost by how you respond to incidents, right? Especially with the big, the big um, incidents, we've observed that. And so 
it depends on whether you're very defensive or whether you're very open on how you respond and communicate during an incident, similar to what Olivier said before. Uh, so that means that even if you have a super strong security posture, you need to prepare also for incident. Um, the example here is Microsoft's uh, recent write-up or revelation on um, how they lost the um, private key for signing access tokens to the Chinese hacker group Storm 0558. Um, so for that gr hacker group, stars really lined up, right? Uh, secret scanner didn't work properly, and then there was a race condition uh, with the private key in the dump, and, uh, and the right engineer was uh, compromised, or his workplace, rather. Um, so it really shows that no one is fully, you know, protected, right? So this should, for us mortals, really be a motivation to prepare for incidents. Now, you can say, or, or I can hear already, you know, some leadership people saying that, yeah, but you prepare for uh, incidents, that not, that's not productive time, right? But ultimately, what we do in my opinion, is we, it's like an insurance, right? We have this upfront investment into preparing for incidents, and which pays out when we're much faster and much more, um, much more structured in answering to, in responding to incidents. You can, you can push that even further, and with that, we, we get into, into uh, business continuity management, disaster recovery, when an attacker manages to, to encrypt your database or even one of your infrastructure suppliers goes down, um, you want to be able to very quickly re-establish uh, your environment and put it, put it back up, right? Uh, you would typically say, okay, let's uh, restore backups, etc. That's fine, but just, you know, make sure your code version is in line with the, with the data uh, model, is also in line with your um, configuration back at that point. So these are all things that sometimes, you know, go lost a bit in the, uh, in the process. At Fertig, what we do is that we have a security incidents response um, process that defines roles and responsibilities, similar to also what Olivier said before. And we, we use playbooks. We have playbooks prepared for different scenarios that would the, the main purpose of these playbooks is to reduce the stress level during an incident, right? And we would typically validate these playbooks, these checklists also, um, during using tabletop exercises. So we would do dry runs, drills, of, um, on how we would behave during that incident, whether access permissions are, are uh, correct, everyone has them, whether um, you know everyone is is up to date, what to do? We would document findings, improve the playbook. Ultimately, we would also write post mortems, and that's probably the most important thing of a security incident. It's it needs to be blameless, so it's not about who did something wrong or which team, etc. It's about what can we improve, even if it was uh, human error at the source of the incident, what can we improve, which process, which technolo technology can we improve to make things sec more secure in the future? Um, I don't know if you remember, uh, in January this year, there was the Circle CI hack. Circle CI is a CI CD platform in the cloud that we use. Uh, and, you know, you get a message uh, on 4th of uh, January, I think it was, Circle CI announcing that you have to rotate all credentials on that CI CD system, right? Mm. Great start into the year. Uh, well, <coughs> we wrote, we did that within you know one or two days, um, and we took the learnings. And I want to emphasize here on the on the post mortem um, uh, culture, we took learnings on how we can improve rotating secrets. We, we took learnings on how we can improve the usage of, uh, of CircleCI itself, and also what would we do in the shoes of CircleCI, so changing the perspective here. Obviously, this postmortem then, we shared it with the entire engineering team uh, and took the important learnings from it. 
to wrap up uh, this presentation, I, uh, well, I gave you some insights into how we at Fertic manage DevSecOps. Uh, we talked about the engineering culture and the importance of it, about threat modeling, about a secure tech stack, uh, credential management, and how we can re reduce the impact and likelihood of leaked secrets, and also about how to do um, incident response. DevSecOps, in our understanding, is uh, not simply about adding tools and tech to the pipeline, right? In fact, it's rather about people, process, and technology, usually in that order. If I've learned one thing in my career, it's that you know what, my, what works for you might not work for me. So um, instead, I think security always has to be tailored to your organization or to your use case. And with that, I'm already looking forward to hear from you how you integrate SEC into your DevSecOps. Thank you. Merci, Manuel. Merci, Manuel, für die schöne, schöne Bilder von deiner Frau, <lacht> wo man da immer rechts hat gesehen, hat gesehen, ja? Vergleich. Ähm, jede Question, Frage. Si ce n'est pas le cas, moi j'ai une question, c'est clair, j'ai préparé une. Um, tu as dit que tu dois euh, jouer un playbook. Comment tu fais ça Comment tu fais ça Combien de fois vous jouez ce jeu d'incident Et puis est-ce que vous jouez toujours le même Donc vous prenez toujours le même incident ou bien vous changez mm -hmm. et puis Maintenant, je suis confus dans quelle langue euh, répondre. <rire> Alors, je change Twitch. en français. Alors, on fait ça plus ou moins une fois par année. On vient, on vient de commencer, donc euh, c'est un, un processus répétitif. Euh, et puis, on essaie aussi de, 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 de prendre d'autres euh, euh, équipes et puis d'autres personnes à bord. Enfin, la communication, on a entendu, euh, est très importante. Donc, euh, c'est aussi l'équipe de communication qui, qui nous rejoint la prochaine fois. Et puis, euh, puis c'est toujours un scénario différent qu'on essaie de, de jouer euh, qui, qui dépend fort de qu ce qui est actuellement sur, euh, dans notre risque, euh, appréciation des risques. Quoi. Merci. J'avais promis de ne pas poser de questions, mais j'en fais quand même une. Euh, pas de bière pour merci toi. tout d'abord pour la présentation. <rire> Concernant le threat modeling avec Stride, vous refaites à tout bout de champ des, des remises à jour, mais comment, comment tu, tu organises ça C'est vrai que quand on voit un peu l'évolution, c'est continu qu'on devrait le faire pour après adapter les, les contrôles. Ouais. Euh, donc ce qu'on fait, c'est on, on focalise vraiment sur la, sur la feature qu'on qu est en train de travailler. Um, et puis on fait du threat modeling surtout à la, à la phase de conception, donc à la au début, pour, ce, pour cette feature euh, justement actuelle. Et puis après, il y a aussi euh, ben des, des features euh, suivantes qui peut-être touchent un peu à ça, qui considèrent aussi ce, cette, euh, le système global, si tu veux. Et puis, il y a aussi l'équipe de sécurité qui en fait aussi des, des threat models un peu plus, euh, plus globales. Donc, en général, je pense que le, la couverture de nos activités de threat modeling se tient plus ou moins la balance euh, en, sur, le, sur le temps. Ouais. Et est-ce qu'il y a des clients qui te demandent en particulier des soit les résultats de, de votre modèle ou bien qui ont des, des, des modèles de compliance différents euh, ou bien est-ce que vous avez imposé un peu une méthode et puis voilà après vous la mettez à dispo parce qu'il y aura avec la nouvelle ISO il y aura des, des nouveaux contrôles ça, qui vont arriver puis ça va être demandé donc c'est super intéressant d'avoir quelque chose qui est bien établi. Um. <coughs> Donc en général euh, les clients ils vont pas à cette profondeur là 
que nous, donc au niveau de, 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 de je crois que c'était toujours dans le contexte de threat modeling, right? Um, alors, ils ne vont pas euh, en profondeur, dans cette profondeur-là, mais euh, clairement, les clients, ils demandent euh, des assurances de sécurité qui sont, ouais, mieux, euh, donc, euh, tu t'entends tout, quoi. <rire> mais, mais, justement, on a maintenant eu, euh, d'ailleurs, semaine passée, on a eu le, euh, des audits aussi pour le ISO 27000. Euh, donc, euh, avec ça, on espère quand même de d'assurer les clients qui, qui, euh, qui sont très, très demandants quand même. Ouais. D'accord. D'autres questions Si ce n'est pas le cas, merci. Filmas, Manu, Ancre Filmas. Je pense qu'on peut encore applaudir une Anke. fois. Okay.